frame is quite different from smart glasses that have come before. Uh, it doesn't run Android or any of these, you know, big operating systems or anything like that. And it's based around uh, more of an embedded microcontroller than it is the typical processor you'd find in a phone or anything like that. So because of that, it's very low power. Um, it's, hence, it's so thin and lightweight. And all of the electronics are crammed into just the little nose bridge you see at the front. Uh, so it's quite a feat. We also learned a lot from Monocle, uh, making very, very tiny electronics. So it's very low power. Um, but with that comes a lot of interesting constraints. A lot of the inspiration behind how we sort of design this comes from a little bit of the bygone era of like retro gaming and these kinds of things, where these companies used to do so much with like such little hardware. So we followed the same kind of ethos to pack as much performance into the frame hardware as we could. The mic control in frame um, is a Bluetooth chip. Um, it's a Cortex M3, 64 megahertz. Um, it's got 512K of flash. Uh, you know, it's like 100 and something or 200K of RAM, something like that. So as soon as you start comparing it to the hardware we have these days, it's very, very constrained. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things you can do with it. And we'll go through some examples and show some demos. Uh, still on. Um, interesting fact, uh, a lot of the Bluetooth um, trackers that you see, things that you put on your uh, suitcase, your keys, kind of find you know, air tags and things like that. We are using the same kind of device as, uh, as those. So whereas those just track your bag, uh, this does a lot of stuff. Uh, granted, there's an FPJ in there as well, so it's not just one chip. Um, but yeah, we'll go, we'll go through some of the, the different hardware features. So the probably most exciting thing about Frame is the display, one of the most exciting things. And it's a uh, um, 640 by 400 uh, VGA micro OLED. Um, it's a color screen. And it's this tiny little OLED that you can see in the top of the right-hand lens. And um, that goes through this prism that you see here. And it shows up as a sort of floating display. So for anyone who may be watching this online or you haven't tried putting on frame yet, you see this floating screen uh, in front of you. It's roughly the size of like a large phone or an iPad or something sort of arm's length um, from you. And um, it's a color screen. Uh, you can show text, graphics, all kinds of stuff on there. Uh, there's also a 720p camera right in the front, right in the middle of the nose bridge. Um, it's a very tiny, sort of, almost like a pinhole camera. Um, there's a microphone. Uh, the microphone hole is on the sort of back side of the frame. Um, and there is an IMU. Uh, the IMU has an accelerometer and magnetometer built in. Uh, it's also able to detect taps, which is one of the primary inputs uh, to frame. So when you're designing your UX um, and your interface to, to your frame app, um, tap is a great way of interacting with frame. Um, you can, of course, use your voice. Um, and you can um, use head movement as well to sort of track um, different, maybe if you want to make menus or something like that. So overall, frame is very simple when it comes to hardware. Um, there's not a huge amount in there. Um, but what's in there does is doing quite a lot. And um, everything works over Bluetooth. So uh, you have a Bluetooth link to some kind of host device, could be your laptop, could be a mobile phone, could be anything. And the idea is that Frame runs a sort of simple um, app, basically. And your host device is, is handling the data that comes and goes. Um, so maybe you want to stream camera data or stream audio data. Um, our NOAA app, for example, um, streams images and audio to the app. It then sends that to OpenAI, and then the responses that come back from OpenAI are printed on the screen. So that's generally how you would make some kind of app. Um, but you can actually put full apps on Frame if you wanted to um, in some way. Uh, so Frame runs uh, Lua. Um, Lua is a very lightweight um, scripting language. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's very stable. Um, for those of you who might have uh, used Monocle in the past, um, on there, we use MicroPython. Um, so it's the same sort of idea, um, comparing those two frameworks. Um, they're not too different from each other um, in terms of you know, performance and these things. Um, quite different how they work. Um, but we tried to keep things similar because we kept the APIs um, between Monocle and Frame um, very closely matched. So I'll show you some examples of how you can write these little Lua apps uh, to work on Frame. 
So, and then it's really sort of an open road. If you want to make full blown games and things, you can sort of start building these, these apps on frame, putting the whole script on there, or you can have it more dynamic where it's reloading off the mobile phone or your laptop, uh, more of a sort of, uh, you know, single line scripting type of thing. So yeah, let's jump into some examples to the TV malfunction going on. So what you can start off with, um, who here has a Mac? A lot of hands go up. Love it. <laughs> Classic Bay Area. Who here has Windows? Great. Who here is on Linux? One person. <laughs> nice. All right. So um, Linux person, we're going to help you out a little bit later on. Um, right now, we have a uh, tool, a Python tool called Frame Utils. Um, it works great on Mac. Um, Windows can be a bit funny based on your Bluetooth card that you have um, or the Bluetooth driver. Um, Linux, there is currently a bug in the um, underlying Bluetooth library that we're using, um, but we can we can try. We, there's other ways we can fix this. So, ah, oh, the screens are back. Fantastic. So, um, you can start by going to um, this link here, and this is Frame Utils. So Frame Utils is um, a bunch of utilities that were growing over time that lets you quickly get up and running with Frame. Um, it has a whole bunch of things in there. You can generate image, like, uh, images, like um, images. The fonts are generated on Frame um, using this tool. Um, but there is a Bluetooth library in here that lets you communicate very easily with Frame. So we'll use this for some examples. So I'm just going to open up my VS Code here. All right. Who here is familiar with Python? A few hands. Nice. Who here knows a tiny bit of Python or has some exposure to it, at least? <laughs> nice. Who here is not a developer? Or, yep, nice. Awesome. So we can, um, we can get started. Uh, we're going to start off with the more sort of low level, um, how, how Frame works under the hood a little bit. Um, and then later on, we're going to show you the new SDK we're working on. Um, and the SDK lets you um, interact with Frame on a little bit more of an abstracted level. So you don't have to do all these little detailed communications with Frame. You can just record audio. You can just request an image. Um, and then you can start building into your app. Who here is more of a mobile developer? A couple sort of hands, yeah. Um, any web developers? Yeah, OK, nice. So everything I'm about to show you um, can works perfectly on mobile. Um, we have a Flutter library um, for anyone who's familiar with Flutter um, that pretty much does exactly the same thing as Frame Utils. Um, we also have, we're also working on a, a React plugin. I'm not sure when that's going to be out, but that's also in the works. And on Monocle, um, a lot of how the Bluetooth works on Frame uh, comes from Monocle as well. And on Monocle, we had a, um, a JavaScript library uh, and a web, like a web tool that you could interact with the Python shell. Um, so there's inspiration there you can take. Uh, more or less one-to-one, -one. Um, it'll work. You just need to change out some of the inner workings. Um, but Frame Utils actually serves as a great template for um, anyone who's making an app. They might want to be porting to, to their own library or anything like that. So if you go to um, the GitHub for Frame Utils, and then you go into Source, and then Bluetooth here, this is a fairly small file. Um, this is everything you need to communicate to Frame, everything you need to send data, receive data, um, send files. Uh, it's all sort of in here, less than 300 lines. Um, so if you port this to a JavaScript library, you can use the web, um, web Bluetooth APIs. Um, if you port this to any kind of mobile framework, um, you can more or less follow this as a template. And that's, that's essentially what we have in the Flutter um, library, and that's what the sort of React library will be. The SDK that I mentioned before, 
this is a level above this. So under the hood, it uses frame utils to do all of the low-level communication. And this is how you get the most control. So there is a, since we're using Bluetooth, um, the, the bandwidth limit is essentially the Bluetooth link. So, yep. <laughs> GitHub doesn't like that. Oh, that's cool working. I'm going to actually jump over to here now anyway. Is that clear enough at the back? Shall I zoom in a bit more? OK. Maybe that much. So yeah, the, the, the limit is essentially your Bluetooth bandwidth. And so there's a little bit of a trick to making your apps efficient to actually do what you want. So if you want like high FPS, if you want to stream images really fast, if you want higher quality audio that you want to get off, um, then it's good to kind of understand this little low level library a little bit more. If you don't want to have to deal with that straight away, um, the, the SDK is a good way to just get up and running. And then later on, you can work down into optimizing things. Um, so we'll talk about the SDK a little bit later on. But for now, I'm going to show you some quick examples here. So I've got VS Code open on my laptop here. Um, and I've just got a um, folder on my desktop called Hackathon. And I've got that folder open over here. So um, for those of you familiar with Python, uh, I'm just going to make a virtual environment here. So this uh, essentially creates like an um, empty Python environment um, that's not connected to my regular Python tool. So this is the command to create a virtual environment. Um, you don't have to do this. Um, it's just a good way of keeping things in a little container. Uh, and that creates this virtual environment folder here. So I'm going to select this environment, um, command shift P or control shift P on Windows. Um, and you can do select interpreter. And then where is it? There it is, virtual environment. There we go. And if I hit enter here, maybe if I reload, reload window, there we go. You can see that we're now in the virtual environment. So whenever I run anything in Python here, it assumes there's, there's no Python, um, there's no libraries or anything like that installed at the moment. So I'm going to go over to here and I'm going to copy this pip install frame utils. And I'm going to paste that in. So this is installing frame utils. This takes a moment. And in the meantime, I'm going to create a new Python file. So save this, call it main.py. All right. So clear my screen there. And let's copy. There is an example uh, on this page. Um, and you can copy paste this. And let's try it out. OK, so can you guys read that from the back? Sort of. Good. All right, so this example sends uh, two Lua commands um, to frame. Um, so you might notice that I'm mixing up Lua and Python here. So frame utils is a Python library, um, which is a little bit funny, um, just because it's so common and people are used to it. But the thing that frame runs is Lua. Um, and so these strings that you see here, these are Lua strings. So this print hello world is, is Lua. Um, and then print one plus two is also Lua. So it's exactly the same Lua as if you'd um, run it on your desktop. So if I run Lua here and I do print hello world, this exact same thing is going to run on frame. Um, as of now, it's actually the same version of Lua as well. Um, so that's the nice thing about Lua is that it's it's a very stable language. Um, it's it's been around for a very long time, so it's got sort of these quirks of being old old syntax. Um, and we'll go over some of those a little bit later on. Um, but the nice thing is is you can develop um, apps locally on your desktop, and then when you port them to frame, um, it you can really expect them to work the same. 
uh, and it's very simple language. Um, so if anyone familiar with scripting languages, um, even compared to Python, I'd say you can probably learn most of this from YouTube on a weekend sort of thing. Um, so there is one difference, however, a couple differences. Um, one of the main differences is what you see here in Lua is um, something called a REPL. So the characters that you see when I type things in, um, my, key, my, my terminal is sending characters to the Lua REPL, and the Lua REPL is echoing them back, hence we see them. Um, there's certain characters that you don't see. For example, if I press the escape key, the REPL is receiving the escape key, but it doesn't do anything. Um, same if I do things like control C, uh, it kills uh, the terminal. Um, so there's all these little shortcuts that the REPL handles, um, but they're not handled on frame. Um, and the reason is, is when, you're, when we have such little Bluetooth bandwidth, you want to maximize that for useful information. You don't want to have all this sort of data going to frame and then the echoes coming back because that's wasting a lot of Bluetooth bandwidth. So frame only echoes stuff that you explicitly tell it to echo. So if I go back into Lua again, if I do um, this example, print one plus two, in the regular Lua REPL, you can just do one plus two and it prints three. If you did that on frame, um, you'd get an error because you haven't told it to return that. And what the Lua REPL is doing under the hood is whenever you type things like one plus two, it itself wraps it in a print. Basically, it, it puts in a return function. Um, so there's a little slight difference there. So every time you want to actually have frame print something back on the terminal, um, you'll have to wrap it in a print. So let me kill this again. And let's run this example, and I'll show you what's happening. So. It's going to connect to my frame dev kit that's on the table here. So when I hit run, um, frame utils will want to pair. Um, I can hit connect here. And there you can see um, frame ran. It ran this script. It returned hello world and three. So this Lua ran completely on frame. Um, so this full Lua um, virtual machine essentially runs on frame. And it can run itself as well. You can put Lua files on here, and it will just run those. Um, so let me take you through each of these lines and what they're doing. So this first line here um, sets up a Bluetooth object. It's the frame Bluetooth object. And then we call connect uh, on that object. Then this is, we can split this up a little bit to make it a bit simpler. So I'm going to uh, pull this one out. I'm going to do result equals this. And then I'll print the result. And let's comment out that one for now. And then once I'm done, I'm disconnecting. So this is an async function. Um, so we need to, because this sends to frame, um, it runs on frame, and then something comes back, um, we need to tell Python that, hey, wait for this to finish. So that's what this await does. Um, and to have this work, we need to wrap um, into a, an async function. Um, so that's why that's there. Otherwise, you can see we get these errors. And then you have to run um, the main like this. You can do async io dot run main. Um, there's a lot of other Python things um, going on here that you can actually build on top of. Um, you can have multiple of these running at the same time, all kinds of stuff. Um, but just to keep this example simple, we're pretty much going to just follow this template today. So here, um, we're sending this Lua string, print hello world to frame. And then we have this await print flag uh, set to true. So this tells this function that, hey, uh, wait for frame to respond and then return me the result. If we got rid of this, um, it would run this on frame but it wouldn't wait for the result. It would just move on. So that would be the equivalent of not having the await there. Um, so you may want to do that if you want to store variables on frame, if you want frame to do something, um, but you don't necessarily care about anything being returned. Um, you can just do that. Um, you don't need to have that await print. Um, and you, you also don't need to await it because it will just do it. Uh, it's good to await anyway, because if you, try to, if you don't await them and you have multiple send lures, um, it can send faster than the Bluetooth can actually send them. So it's good to have that anyway. Um, so internally, it will be faster anyway. 
So I'm going to put that back over there. So this is the same thing. So I'm going to print hello world. It connects to frame. Oh, device needs to be reset. Connecting to a different frame. So you're gonna you're <laughs> you're gonna notice this actually. Um, frame will uh, the frame utils will attempt to connect to the closest device, um, but it will. It's not always perfect because that's the way Bluetooth works. So when you're running um, uh, frame utils and you're actually running it on your device, try to have your device really close. Otherwise, you might end up connecting someone else's frame and then you're paired to someone else's frame and you'll, you'll be driving each other mad. <laughs> you can't like unpairing and pairing all the time. So you can really bring your frame right close to, um, to the device and then it should work. So let me try this again. Oops. Good. Should work now. Might need to unpair or something. Let me do this here. It's the demo effect. So this is a good opportunity to uh, show you the pairing situation. So we can do forget this device. In factory reset my frame. And so on your frame, you will use that little pin on the back of the on the back of the charger. Frame turns on again. I can run it and it should connect now. Where is this frame it's connected to? Connect. There we go. Oh, I didn't save the file. There we go. I can run that again. And now it should just print hello world. There we go. So that's a little hello world example. Um, some of you might have spotted a bit of a problem here. What happens when your apps start getting really big? Are you really going to send like these one line Lua <laughs> strings to frame? So there's an interesting, there's another interesting limitation here, and this is also around the Bluetooth, um, is that there's only so much data you can send in one go over Bluetooth. Uh, that's called the MTU size. Um, and this value is set between the host device and frame. So it could be anywhere between 20 bytes and 240 something. That's what we've set as like the max. Um, but you don't know what that is until the connection's done. The host negotiates that based on power, you know, power requirements and all this kind of stuff. So at some point, if you keep making these Lua strings bigger and bigger and bigger, you won't be able to send that. Um, so it's good to start sending files instead. So we'll get to that a little bit later on. Um, but there's quite a bit we can do with just this uh, send Lua um, function. So we'll we'll stick to this for a little while. But just we'll just keep in mind that. All of this can be turned into a file, and we'll send the file later on. So let's load up another example. Um, here you can, we're going, we're going to turn these, um, these examples into a little bit better documentation at some point. Um, but if you go into the GitHub and you go to the frame code base, um, this is the complete firmware project for frame. And um, in here, we have a folder called tests. And these tests. Um, pretty much test the entire Lua API. So this is the test that we use when we're actually releasing a firmware. Um, we make sure all of these work, um, but it's a good, it's a really good template for you to build your own apps because you can see how each of the functions work. Uh, oh, we've lost the screens again. So this first file here, test uh, API. This is every um, Lua. Oh, screens are gone again. <laughs> Maybe you can look at this on your own machines at the same time. Um, so the, that first file, test API, that is all of the Lua APIs that frame um, accepts, essentially. So there's regular Lua that runs on the device. Um, and then we've actually added a frame library. And this frame library essentially talks to the hardware, the low-level hardware. So when you call frame.display.text, it actually talks to the FPGA and says, hey, print this text here on the screen. So in some ways, when usually you think of scripting languages as being quite slow, all of the things that need to be fast are hardware accelerated anyway. And the Lua is just a wrapper around a C function or an FPGA function that actually does the work. So you don't need to worry too much about the performance that, that Lua brings um, or like the, the, the lack of performance. Um, because anything that needs to be particularly fast, we we optimize those under the hood anyway. Um, and this is continuously improving. The API is always evolving. Um, we're trying not to change them too much, um, but we're definitely adding to them. 
So in the documentation pages, uh, if you go to uh, the building apps uh, section under frame, and then the Lua API, um, and maybe you can look on your own screen. So maybe you have someone around you has that page open. Um, we have the whole library reference for all of these hardware functions um, documented that you can see. If the screens come back. Um, but we've got a section on display. Um, some of the basic functions of display are, as I said, display.text. Um, we've got things for camera. You can capture an image. You can download the image to your, to your host device, to your phone or your laptop. Uh, microphone, IMU, all these things have sort of simple APIs and a little example as well on how you can use those. Oh, we're back again. And have a quick look at display before the screens turn off again. So this is that text API that I mentioned. So frame.display.text, you give it something you want to print on the screen, uh, coordinates, and optionally a color and like character spacing if you want. Zoom. Bit too much. That's probably okay. Move it on to. There we go. Um, we have a feature um, for printing bitmap images. Um, we're going to be improving this this um, API soon with uh, something that is a little bit more wrapped up, so you don't have to have so many parameters in there. And coming soon, we have a vector engine as well. And so that does hardware accelerated um, vector um, printing, and hopefully at some point splines as well. Um, so we have that work on the FPJ. We're just trying to fit everything in at the moment. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things you're able to do. You're able to do animations, um, show sprites, um, layer them up, and all these kinds of things. Um, and then we have the, the final function is display.show. Uh, and that actually shows everything you've layered up on the screen. So it's a very simple API. And we'll go through an example in just a moment. Um, another example I can show you. Uh, let's see, IMU is always fun. Um, so we have this IMU.direction. It returns roll, pitch, and heading. Um, heading isn't implemented yet. Uh, there's, we have to add a note here that it's not, not implemented yet. So you get the roll and pitch. Um, you can also get the raw values, the raw accelerometer and compass values, if you just want like the number. Um, and you can also assign something to happen on the tap. Uh, so we'll see, see that example in a little bit as well. So this is a good page to just have open. Um, you can just search for the same API that's in here. Um, so this is an extra library that we've added into Lua. Um, so everything that you, you do on frame, you'll probably be using these, these libraries a lot. And then the other thing I mentioned that's slightly different with Lua on frame than it is on your regular desktop, for example, is the standard libraries. So we have all the standard libraries except for the IO and system libraries. Um, because, Lua, because frame isn't... Um, like a POSIX, you know, Unix type of um, system. Um, those didn't make sense. Um, we've actually got our own IO library for file handling. Um, and that is also documented in here. Uh, let's see. That is this file system. Um, so that's the equivalent of the IO library. Um, and then system library, um, we have the system functions. It's just basic stuff like version and this kind of stuff. So. Yeah, that's the that's the only difference. But all the other Lua all the other Lua libraries are the same. The math library, string library, um, all of that's in there. Coroutines even in there. Um, so there's a lot you can you can do. So um, let's jump back to these examples. Uh, let's see, go here, and let's pick one. Let's do. Let's try camera. That one's always fun. Just camera. Actually, let's do this one. Camera FPS. And let's try this one. It's a little bit easier to run. So I've just copied the whole thing here. Actually, before we do that, that one's a little bit complicated. Let me try. I know what. This one. Test text API. This, um, this prints a bunch of text on the screen. Um, and it tests every combination, hence there's so many lines. Um, but don't get scared away. Um, it's just copy-pasted one after the other. So let me copy this one. All right, I'm just going to paste in the whole thing. So the start is pretty much the same thing as we saw before. So we've got this Bluetooth object. 
I've just called it B here. Um, and we're connecting to it. And um, I've added one more parameter into the connect function here. And that is something called this, this print response handler. Let me zoom in a bit more. Why this part? Hear this. Do that. So, um, the frame has um, this one serial pipe over Bluetooth. Um, so you can send data and there's another pipe to receive data. Um, and when you're sending Lua and you're printing things from Lua, um, that's just the string. Um, so you send strings and you receive strings. Um, so anything that comes back, uh, what we saw before, we had the print um, wrapped over here um, before the await, and we had the await print set to true. This basically catches everything else. So if frame, for whatever reason, prints something, like you have a script that on some timer prints hello world or anything, um, whatever comes back asynchronously will just go to this function. And in this case, I've just made a Lambda function where it just inline prints whatever came back um, to, to the terminal. So this is just for debugging, basically. So if, you, if you're making an app and um, it's throwing errors and you can't see what that error is, if you add this line, um, it will print out whatever error happened um, whenever it happens. So here, the first thing it's going to do is just print um, some text. So we'll start with just this one. So frame.display.text, and we're printing test, and we're printing it a pixel one, x and y one. This is an interesting quirk of Lua, uh, sort of historical reasons, Lua being a very old language. Um, I don't know the exact reason, um, but there's, uh, there's someone, oh, I'm trying to remember the story now. It was like, um, I think it was like something related to like petroleum industry or something. Like Lua was originally created for um, folks who were like engineers, but back then like it, zero indexing was confusing for people. So frame is one index. So when you have a loop, you go from one to 10, not zero to nine. And that can really throw you, throw you off. Um, it's a bit of a weird quirk stuck around in history. If anyone's used MATLAB, same thing. And um, it's a bit of a weird quirk, but you sort of get used to it. So if I did test zero, zero, it would say an error. It says it has to be between one and um, 640, for example. So here I'm printing test at pixel one, one. And these other lines are just printing um, test in the other corners. So this prints it in the top left. Um, this is top right, um, bottom left, bottom right. Um, and I've just made these numbers so that the text exactly fits in the box. So that's just part of the test. So it prints, we set these four test messages in each corner, and then we do show. And then we're sleeping for two seconds. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to just exit this script here. So I'm going to do sys.exit. So this will just stop the test going any further than this. So let's run this thing. All right, let's see if frame connects to the right one. My laptop connects to the right frame. So that ran, and you can see nothing returned back on the terminal because we didn't ask to print anything. We just said, print this text in the corners and then show. Um, so this is what I mean by you can keep the Bluetooth kind of quiet and you can make use of that bandwidth for other important functions such as returning images and audio and things while this stuff is still going on in the background. So um, if the guys at the back could switch the camera to my phone view. I wonder if there's a way to like split screen. Can you split screen? Sure. Uh, so it's from my phone. You see me on the Zoom on the phone. 
Oh, you need to um, undisable my phone for shit. Got a bit of janky setup here. You can see test. It's a bit blurry, but you can see test in each corner of the screen. So if you're curious, this is just like a frame development board that we have. Um, so it just exposes the bare screen. And um, uh, let me go jump back to my screen here. Uh, so you can switch back to my desktop view. So we can uh, have a look at this next this next test. I'm just going to hold the mic. I think bending over is doing my back in. Can um, have a look at this next one. So that was the four tests. Um, Frame can also accept UTF-8 characters. So we have all of the Latin um, character set um, baked into the font package on Frame. So I've got the three famous Swedish characters here. Uh, fun fact, I live in Stockholm. We're all over the world as a team. Um, so here we are printing these three um, characters. And you probably can't see that, but on the, on the frame, it's, it's showing those three characters. So you can send UTF-8 in here. You can, if you want, send an emoji. Um, just right in here, you can throw an emoji in. And if your Lua code knows what to do with that, it will do it. So we don't have any emojis baked into... Um, the frame um, font set at the moment. We do have some for the Noah app, um, but we don't have any um, like the regular emojis in there. Um, but you can actually save them as, as sprites. Um, you can export those as sprites if you want, um, and you can send them to frame using the bitmap function. Right back. Uh, and if a character isn't in the font library, it just won't print anything. So you don't have to worry about it throwing an error or anything like that. Um, it just won't print anything. Um, of course, you can't have things like new lines and stuff in here. Um, it doesn't understand. This will just print text in a row. Um, you can also change the color. So we're going to try that in a minute. So I'm going to move this, this one down here. There is an optional parameter in the text function called spacing. Um, this just changes the character spacing. Um, so if I run this now, It's going to do the first three. Um, so it shows the test in the corners and then those three characters. And now it shows um, you can switch back to a, um, a Roger. You can switch back to um, the other screen. Is it working? No. There you go. So you can see test printed with different amounts of spacing between them. Um, so there's some way you can jazz up your, um, your UI design. And then, of course, we've got colors. So we'll move the exit function down a bit. Uh, you can switch back to the other view again. Uh... Switch back to my screen share. Yep, no worries. <laughs> Perfect. So um, the color colors here are name parameters. Um, so it is. Um, so I'm printing the word um, white, and then the color is uh, this optional parameter, um, and then gray, and then the color value gray, red, etc. So each of them, I'm just printing them one by one. Um, in two columns. So um, 
first thing I can tell you about is what's going on here. So if you're not familiar with Lua, um, this is something called a table. And um, a uh, table is essentially, it's a bit like a, I guess, close thing would be like a Python dictionary. Um, but you can have a, a sort of key and a value. So here the key is color and um, the, the value is white as, as a string. Um, Lua is nice that there's not that many types. Um, so this table type is like what you'd use for arrays. Um, it covers a lot of things. Um, but what, so that's what these curly braces are. It says this is a table. And inside, there's this um, this color key, and set it to white. Just the same up here. The spacing is a um, is one of these keys as well. So this makes it a sort of optional thing. Um, in Python, the equivalent is having um, um, let's see the the Python equivalent is basically having like the name of the variable equals. So it's the same thing as that. Uh, just the Lua syntax instead. So there's 16 colors, and these colors are hard-coded by default, but you can override them. Um, right now, the, the way the API is designed is that the name of the color doesn't change, but you can change the actual color itself. Uh, we had to do some tricks to get the colors working nicely on frame um, and to actually fit the, the board into the housing. So this is a little bit of a side quest I'll go into. Um, so the color, the, the, the screen is a 10-bit um, color screen. So it can show a lot of colors, um, but we could not physically fit that many wires in the PCB through the board. The board is so thin that to get all those wires is just not going to happen. So we removed two of the lines, so we made it 8-bit color. Um, and um, then we had a problem with the memory in the FPGA. So if you start calculating things, um, we need a screen buffer that's 640 by 400 pixels. And um, if they were each pixel was a 10-bit color, that turns into a lot of bits, uh, a lot of, lot of bytes. Um, and we just didn't have that much space. So the, what we could fit were um, 640 by 400 and um, orbit color. Um, so what those four bits are, they're actually indexes to each of these. So there's 16 possible colors you can have. Um, but what those colors can be are then later down the chain in the FPGA, they are then turned into the 8-bit value that goes out. So you can set those, um, those colors to any 8-bit color, um, but there is only 16 of them you can actually assign. And so 16, uh, also 640 by 400 um, divided by 2, because each pixel takes half a byte, um, and two of those, because we have two frame buffers, um, that is the majority of the RAM that is used in frame. Um, we also have one more block uh, in a similar way that is the actual camera um, um, buffer. So it's the same thing in the other direction. So this is um, a, one of the quirks um, and sort of a little bit of the inspiration about how we design this. Um, this is a trick that old video game consoles used to use. So they'd have these sprite sheets, um, and then they'd have like a separate color palette. Um, and when you would actually print the sprite, it would look up the indexes in those sprites to the color palette and then print the real colors. Um, that gave some really nice tricks because you could have um, multiple sprites of different colors, but the actual asset data is the same. Or well, you just change the palettes for that. So the common, um, uh, or the famous example, is the mushrooms in, in Super Mario. So the red and green um, is the same sprite. It's just a different color palette. And so the same thing you can do on frame. So you can have these assets that are um, one color, um, and then you're just assigning it a different color. And this is exactly what's happening under the hood with the text. Each character is just a sprite. And it's just a, a two-bit sprite, actually. So it's an it's a on-pixel or off-pixel. And this um, color palette just offsets the palette. So it's using a certain color instead of the regular color. Um, so that's all that's doing. So here we're just writing two columns um, of these different colors, just printing them in their different locations. So you can see I've manually just um, put the, their, their positions. Um, and, so, and then I do display.show at the end. So it's all 16 colors. Um, these, my Python has just saved these on multiple lines, but it's just like this, essentially. 
So they're all the same like that. And let me run this. So you can switch the screen back to my camera. There we go. All these colors. So we have named these colors um, based on what we thought was a, well, nice sensible names. Um, but as I said, you can override each of these. And there is a function that lets you set the, uh, you can either set the um, RGB values and it's just a regular um, RGB hex value. Um, but the actual screen works in YCBCR, um, which is an, like an old format that was used commonly like in television. Um, but it actually gives like a really, it's a little bit close to what our eyes perceive as color. Um, so you can use that as well. So under the hood, it gets converted. Um, but if you don't want to go into that detail, you can just use the RGB. Um, but if you're really like got eye for design, you want to get exactly the right color, um, you want to use that YCBRC value. And you want to you make sure you check the docs so you can understand how the, the actual bits of those colors are separate. Um, if you choose, um, as I said, it's 8 bits, so it's 255 maximum colors, essentially. Um, so if you choose an RGB value that's too close to another color, it just gets rounded off to that. So if you end up changing like the RGB value just like a couple digits, you probably won't see any difference because it's just rounding it off. Um, so... There's a little bit of a trick there um, to get these sort of colors exactly how you want. Um, but uh, I can show you a little bit later on. For anyone who's interested, I can come one on one. I can show you how we can actually see all the colors, um, uh, what, they, what they would look like. I have a script that shows you how to do that. Cool. So that is, um, that is sort of the basics of printing text on the screen. Um, there's not that much more to it. So you have the text value itself, position, color, spacing. Um, you can have as many of them as you want, and then you do show, and it shows them. Um, let's see. Let's jump to another example. So, let me try this one. Try this one first. This one's interesting. This is um, testing the IMU. You zoom in again. Actually, I'm just going to copy this one. So this, this file is called um, test IMU direction. So I'm going to delete everything and paste this in. Hey, I'm going to get rid of this. We don't need that anymore. Oops. And I'm going to clean this up a little bit. This one. OK. So as I mentioned before, um, we have this IMU function called IMU.direction. And it gives you the direction frame is pointed in. So it gives you um, roll pitch and um, heading. Um, uh, it doesn't have your because there's no gyro in there. Um, so it's a compass. Um, but the heading isn't, it isn't implemented yet. Um, so we've got the roll and pitch. And roll is essentially which way your head is tilted this way. And pitch is forward and backwards. So if you look down, uh, the pitch value goes down. If you look up, pitch value goes up. Um, and it's just in degrees. So let's run this one. So what this will do, um, it's going to, um, it does this continuously. So it calls this direction function, puts it in this response um, uh, variable. Um, and this, this lives in the Lua, um, this resp uh, variable. And then we're printing it. So printing roll, um, two dots in uh, Lua is concatenating a string. Um, so that's what that's doing. Um, so uh, roll and then attach that to the string. So to string response dot, uh, well, the dot roll is the roll. So again, this, this uh, resp is going to be a table. Um, so we're going into the, the key called roll. 
um, and then we are doing a rest.pitch. Uh, if you did the raw function where you just want like the plain X, Y, Z, um, then you could do, you could, instead of doing direction, you can do raw and then it's accelerometer. And then after this, you'd have another square brackets and then you'd put X, Y, or Z. So it's just two, it's like a double array, essentially, 2D array. Um, and so it's just going to print this every 100 milliseconds. So let me run this. Make this up. There we go. So as I tilt my box over, you see the numbers changing there. You see the pitch value changing. So if I put frame in the sort of worn position, you see everything is like close to zero. Um, if I tilt my head down, you see the pitch value goes lower. And when it's like facing exactly down, it's 90 degrees down. And then if I look straight up, it's 90 degrees up. And the same with sideways. Uh, that's to the left side, no right side. It's minus 90. And as I turn my head to the left, it goes plus. And if, if you go upside down, it will, it will go all the way over. So that is uh, just returning these um, um, these raw values. And there is another thing added in here. And we're assigning the tap function um, to print out tap. So this looks a little bit cryptic because I've just wrapped it all on one line. Um, but we're essentially saying the IMU, whenever you tap, call this function. So this is just an inline function in Lua. Um, and we're saying print, tap, and then end. So as I tap the box, you see it prints tap over there. So it gets drowned out a little bit. I kill the script. See, these little tap um, prints that are coming out. Um, so you can assign this to do whatever you like in your UI. Um, uh, tap can run any kind of function you want. So you can actually build a proper function out um, and do some action. Um, or you can just use the raw values if you like. All right, so the last thing I will show you is how to upload a file. Um, and then you should pretty much have everything you need to know to, to just get started. Um, and then I think it's probably easier if uh, I go around and we can actually talk about different ideas and things like that. Um, and then in a little while, we'll jump over to talk about the SDK. So. Hey, try this one. So this tests the FPS rate of the camera. So I'll just change something here. There's a bit of a bug we're fixing in this firmware right now. All right. So I'm going to skip over some of the details because this, this does a little bit more than just a test, um, uh, um, just taking images. So this thing over here is essentially a Lua script. It's a Lua file. Um, you could actually have this as a .lua file saved on your um, project somewhere. Um, and the same function you can use to upload the file itself. So this is a Lua file. It's a state machine. Um, so it's just a switch statement. Um, where it takes an image, it waits for it to be captured, and it then sends it over Bluetooth. Um, and then it just does that over and over again. So it's these three states. Um, and um, uh, this bit does the, this handles the auto exposure frame. Um, if you use the SDK, um, this is all wrapped up in, in one thing. Um, but this is how you would do it under the hood. And this is how you get the most, um, most control. So if any one of you are familiar with Photography, if you use um, DSLR cameras or anything like that, you might recognize some of these. So we've got options for different kinds of metering. So you can use spot metering, center-weighted metering, um, and just full screen average. Um, you've got an exposure um, stops that you can set. So this is when you just dial your exposure up or down on your camera. Um, and then you can set certain limits. You can adjust how the, ex the exposure PID algorithm works underneath. Um, so depending on what you want to do, there's a lot of parameters you can tweak. Um, it can be fairly sensitive once you get down there. Um, and this is also something that's improving and evolving. Um, so there's um, all kinds of stuff uh, you can play around with here. 
Um, and this is the lowest level you can go with the camera. Um, you can also control its like sleep behavior and all kinds of things if you want really low power and things like that. So that's the that's the Lua file essentially. Um, that's uh, that's the whole thing. And um, we're essentially doing the same thing. So we are connecting over Bluetooth. And now there is a new parameter in the connect function that you haven't seen before. It's the data response handler. So there's one interesting thing about sending strings back and forth to frame. Um, it's not a nice way of sending data. If you want to send images or audio, um, if you try to turn those into strings in Lua, you have to do the slash x, zero, zero. So suddenly, instead of having one byte, you have four bytes. Um, so because of that, we've added an, an, a different pipe, essentially. Under the hood, it's the same. Um, it just gets wrapped up differently. Um, but this receives bytes rather than um, string data, um, ASCII data. And um, you send those um, using a special function um, from frame. Um, and it's Bluetooth.send. And that will just send pure data. Whatever you give it, it just sends it as bytes. Um, and so that's the most efficient way to get data back and forth from frame. Um, so here, rather than sending, um, doing Lua send, um, we're doing upload file. And so instead of sending line by line, um, we're just sending this Lua script, um, which is the uh, big string you saw above. And we're saving it as main.lua. And then we're doing a reset. So this is the equivalent of um, killing the app, pressing Control C, in Lua on your desktop and then starting it again. Um, and what Frame does, when it first starts up, it will try to find a main.lua. If it finds it, it will run it. Um, so what we're doing here is we're creating this main.lua. And we're um, saving that into the file system. And then we're restarting Frame. Um, and that just takes a moment, because it's just the, the Lua state machine just reloops. And uh, it will just run this main.lua. Um, and so this is how you can actually permanently load up apps onto your Frame. So the Noah app essentially has one of these. So when you take Noah off the dock and you put it on, you just see the Noah UI straight away, even before it's connected to the phone and the phone is communicating with it. So if you want a standalone app on frame, um, or if you want it to show some UI or do something before it connects to your host, um, you can create this main.lua and save that. And then you can handle everything you want in there. Um, and it just runs itself, essentially. And you can have other files. Um, this main.lua can import other Lua files, so you can save multiple files. In fact, the Noah app is three files. Um, and in main.lua, we do a require, which is the same as an import in Python. Um, and that actually brings in those files and those functions inside. So what this script is doing, it's um, uploading um, that camera test uh, state machine, um, resetting so it starts running. Um, then we wait here. So what happens with the data that's coming in? It goes to this data response handler. If I jump to this function, it's just up here. Oh, no, that's not what I want to do. It's a library. It's up here. So I've got this image buffer at the top. Um, and then this receive data function. So whenever we do a Bluetooth.send from frame, um, this thing will receive some data uh, into this parameter. And then we can read that data and do something with it. So what we're doing here is we're receiving the data, and we're just appending it to this big array. Once we receive uh, a data which is just one character long, or one byte long, um, in the state machine, I've made a state which, once the image is finished, just send like a zero. And so that is what this is catching. As soon as that happens, uh, it saves it as a JPEG. Um, and then it clears the image buffer so it can start again. And this thing down here is just logging how much data we received. So let me run this. Oh, I need to install this plugin on Python. Okay, so AIO console is just, um, this is a key press handler. So I have uh, um, over here, um, I just wait for the user to press enter, then I exit the script. Oops, I did that already to do this. Oh, 
screen's gone again. Okay. All right. You can see that we're receiving the string, uh, so this data. So you can see the bytes sitting here. And if I point the camera to you guys, oh, what did I do? Unpair. Okay. Next again. Then if I open. Here we have an image. There you go. So that is receiving from frame. If I put my hand in the middle, see my hand, there it is. So these are essentially taking these JPEG images. Um, what's the right orientation? I think it's this. There we go. So these are capturing images, and it's just replacing this JPEG over and over again. Um, and audio works pretty much the same way. So um, you essentially um, do a capture, or in the case of the microphone data, you do record, um, and then you read the data um, as it's ready. Um, and then once it's done, you save the file and you start again. Um, and Noah does this whenever you tap and you ask something, uh, it does the same thing. Um, yeah. Um, so we're, we're working on improving several things about the camera. Um, so there's a few things you can uh, keep an eye on. Um, you can see here that the image is fairly overexposed. Um, so we're working on actually improving our exposure algorithm. Um, we're also improving on uh, planning to improve the FPS. Um, so there's a few other tricks you can um, you can do to improve the FPS. Um, and then there's going to be things like white balance and various other features coming later on. Um, as I mentioned, you can change like the metering modes and this kind of stuff. Um, and you can write into your Lua script if you want to make some some of these functions automatic. Um, and we're also going to be adding um, uh, cropping functions. Um, so if you don't need such a uh, big image, if you want to zoom in on something, um, you can crop the image. You can get better quality. You can change the JBook quality. Uh, so there's going to be a bunch of things you can do. Um, an interesting fact, uh, the, the sensor in frame is in portrait view. So normally, the sensor is a, it's a rectangle, and it's, it's this way. But we put it long ways. Um, so when you're wearing frame, you can actually pan the, the sensor, um, the input of the image. It comes as a square, um, but you can pan it down, um, and you can pan it up. You can do that in real time. So you can, for example, attach the, the IMU. When the user tilts their head down, you can pan the camera down so it can maybe read like a menu or a book that they're reading. Um, and when you look up, you can move the camera back up so it can see straight ahead. So there's a lot of interesting tricks you can do. Um, and uh, we're evolving the API. Um, but yeah, that's um, that's more or less what I have to show in terms of the low level of how frame works. Um, so just to summarize, we have um, uh, these um, different APIs for different hardware. Um, these hardware features, we have display, camera, microphone, IMU. Um, there's a few extra um, library functions for saving files, some system functions, some timing functions. Um, and you can see all of those um, in the tests and where also building examples on these. Um, if you want to go one level above this and just abstract away a lot of this detail, um, we'll talk about the SDK a little bit later on, maybe after lunch. And um, uh, essentially, the communication with frame is over Bluetooth. Um, and you have these two different types of pipes, essentially, one for sending string data back and forth, and one for sending raw data back and forth. And um, yeah, we can uh, dive into. Um, some sort of real examples based on what guy, what kind of apps you guys want to build. So, yeah. Um, maybe we can have a, a little break. Um, you guys can already start tinkering away with stuff.